Okay, I'm gonna do some. Okay, I'm gonna do something that I normally wouldn't do, and that is, I'm gonna go back and um, essentially record a, a presentation that I gave earlier this year, and it's mostly because I've had some questions um, come up about it uh, from folks who weren't able to attend and have found that I do a uh, particularly poor job of writing slide notes. Um, the session that I'd like to uh, talk about that I'm going to give an update on um, is uh, my, my part of um, the session presented by myself um, and a number of colleagues at the Dublin Core International meeting in Copenhagen this year in October of 2016. Um, our group was talking um, particularly to update the metadata community on the work that the uh, uh, program for cooperative cataloging um, has been doing, particularly around uh, the discussion related to the embedding of linked data um, in MARC records. PCC group has a number of working group streams that are talking about uh, how to um, allow libraries to uh, put linked data concepts into MARC records, both bibliographic and authority records, and, and look at what are the kind of challenges that are coming up um, related to that kind of work. <clears throat> I've been a part of that group um, working in a, a, a consultatory um, uh, role, uh, particularly um, because uh, for the, well, over the last year, probably because for the year prior, um, I had been I've been working in Mark Edit to experiment with how some of these concepts may make their way into Mark Records, and this was an opportunity uh, to work with a group that was um, trying to implement some of those changes, um, as well as push beyond the initial um, discussions that um, I was uh, having within the application, uh, Mark Edit uh, particularly. Um, my role um, in a consulting, uh, consultant style role um, has been to um, not just uh, provide feedback um, to the group as we are going through and having discussions, but also um, because of Mark Edit, uh, I can uh, take the best practices and the discussions that have been um, we've been having as part of this group and start testing some of their feasibility and developing a pilot test um, around the concepts that, um, that the PCC group has been uh, discussing. So this was an opportunity at Dublin Core to update the community on that work. Um, Jackie Shea, who's been the, the lead um, investigator in the PCC group, um, helped to frame the discussion and really kind of uh, let off the, the presentation, um, uh, providing our uh, attendees a, a really good summary of the work that's been done and the work that's yet to be done. Uh, if you're interested in that, um, I have linked to the uh, full paper um, the, that's part of the uh, proceedings with the Dublin Core. Um, so you can see all of the slides uh, that were a part of these sessions, both Jackie's, myself, and the number of colleagues that we had um, that were giving um, uh, to talks as well. My particular discussion was around technical challenges, technical challenges that have come up um, over the last year, uh, working through um, the uh, discussion, uh, the best practices, trying to implement the best practices that the uh, uh, PCC um, group has been um, discussing. Some of those challenges have been related to the way that MARC is structured. Uh, some of these challenges are related to um, the current infrastructure that we find ourselves within the library community. And this was an opportunity to talk a little bit about that as well as talk about how um, within the pilot, within MARC Edit, um, uh, I've taken an, I've, I've tried to take an approach to um, not only support the pilot, um, but also for those libraries that are interested in um, doing their own piloting work, uh, allow for an infrastructure uh, within the application that would be flexible enough to make that happen.
Um, so what I've done is I've taken the slides that uh, were presented, um, the, the slides that I had presented at the Dublin core session. I've updated them slightly based on some feedback that we got during the session, as well as some work that's been done between um, October and now, um, and would like to go through here and essentially just give um, a, a very quick summation of the work that's been done, as well as potentially a, a short demo of how um, the tools work within MarkEdit for those who are interested in, in piloting that work um, uh, that's being uh, done by the PCC. Um, again, uh, this will represent just the section um, that I did as part of the Dublin Core, and it's really too bad that uh, we didn't get an opportunity to record the session because it was very good, and you're going to miss out on um, the contributions um, that the folks who attended the session um, in the audience provided, um, as well as my colleagues that were um, presenting as well who did a, a fantastic job um, representing the work that the PCC is doing as well as the larger issues um, that have come up as part of that group. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit of background in terms of what I'm giving you here. Um, I hope that it's useful and that it helps to answer some of the questions that I've been getting um, through email um, from folks who either were um, uh, in attendance uh, at the Dublin Core but not able to attend the session um, or who have um, stumbled across the proceedings um, and have had questions based on um, the slides that were part of those proceedings. So with that, I'm going to give you, uh, this session was uh, originally crafted for 20 minutes. My guess is the, this recording will take slightly longer. All right. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to give you, talk, talk to you about what the, the technical challenges were um, and continue to be as part of the uh, PCC um, uh, working group that's looking at linked data. And, and the the, the role that I played particularly and, and continue to play in this group really is around the, the uh, testing of the um, assumptions and the solutions that this group is trying to lay out. And so um, in developing a pilot, so that the pilot could be run not by just myself, but anybody within the group, as well as expanding this pilot to folks outside of the PCC who may be interested in looking at how um, uh, and following the developments of um, how uh, linked data um, concepts could be embedded into MARC records, uh, I set out with a couple of specific goals um, in terms of working on this pilot. Um, one of them would be, uh, is it possible to automatically generate URIs um, following the rules laid out by the PCC? And this is actually a really um, uh, meaty question because the PCC group um, that, that I've been a part of um, are a bunch of um, phenomenal experts in what they do. Uh, they're very, they understand Mark. Um, and unfortunately, when you have folks that understand Mark, it means you understand all of the exceptions um, and all of its complicated, all of its uh, areas where it's complicated, and that sometimes creates very difficult um, rules in order to be followed to um, uh, lay out um, or generate. Um, linked data semantics within MARC records because you end up having to take account for the exceptions. Um, and that, so this was, a, this was a question. Could you um, create a, a, a pilot that um, allowed for flexibility in the rules um, to account for the various, um, the various uh, uh, complications uh, in the MARC format? Um, additionally, I think one of the other things is that uh, in the discussions in this group um, has been also the, the realization that not everybody's going to agree on the rules. Um, there's a set of best practices that I think become well agreed upon, but I also think that there's um, places where you'll have local practice. So in addition to creating a pilot um, that could handle um, the best practices, um, as well as in a systematic way, account for variations in marked data and, and input, um, could you take advantage of a process that would also um, allow for local practice? Um, can the process be repeatable? 
So one of the things that um, is very true is the PCC group is, is filled with folks who use Mark 21. And the recommendations that come out of this group will be tied to um, Mark 21 in, in, in a lot of meaningful ways. Um, the work that I do um, outside of the, the um, uh, PCC group is, is with institutions that don't use Mark 21, um, who use Unimark or other national flavors of Mark. Uh, is this process repeatable? Can we design a pilot in a way that um, once the rules have been established within the PCC, can we take those conceptual rules and rework them to work with other flavors of, of the Mark format? Um, I think one of the other pilot goals was to test library, the current library infrastructure. Um, I think there was a lot of assumptions up front that the infrastructure is there because um, a number of places within the library community, particularly large national libraries as well as um, large institutions um, or cultural heritage institutions like the Getty, have been making their data available as like data for some time. And have been encouraging users to use them um, for a variety of purposes. Um, given that this data has been available in various states since you know early 2012, sometimes a little earlier than that, um, I think there's been an assumption that that the infrastructure needed to support these goals is there. And so this was an opportunity to test that. Um, and then uh, the other one would be, can this process be local? And, and by local, I mean, um, can users add their own endpoints for processing? Um, one of the things that I've become a, a firm believer in is um, I've been working more and more with uh, the PCC group as well as institutions that have been interested in piloting the inclusion of linked data um, concepts into their marked data um, or non-mark data um, has been the, the, the notion that while there will be um, these static hubs of uh, national libraries, this, this, this larger infrastructure that will support um, very well um, known and understood uh, vocabularies and conceptual um, uh, uh, structures. Um, a lot of this will also be local, that there will be a large component of what we do that will be locally managed data. And so can um, MarkEdit support a process that allows users to uh, take advantage of their local data? So that was a question that um, the pilot sought to, to, to deal with. And so after the end of the first year, um, I think we have a pretty good idea of being able to, to give some answers to these, at least in, in the pilot process that we work through. Um, uh, is it possible to generate um, URIs automatically based on PCC rules? Uh, generally, yes. Um, the PCC has a, 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 um, a lot of uh, rules that have been defined. There are a number of um, very particular um, exceptions that are laid out. Um, but I think that in general, the, the, the structure um, and the way that these have been accounted for in, in MARC, um, as well as the, the way that the PCC has been writing out the best practices, they generally are um, able to be accounted for um, within the uh, uh, a particular rules file, at least the way that the pilot was, was structured. Um, does that mean that's going to be true always? Probably not. Um, does it mean that it happens quickly? Absolutely not. Um, does it mean that that, um, that there won't be instances probably into the future where this will not be true. Um, I think that um, you know all of those things that, that, that it's particularly in the future that we may find areas that, that, that this won't work is, is probably true. So I think that it's it's a fair statement to say right now that generally yes, the, the work that the PCC has been focusing on, which is primarily main entry as well as um, uh, the the one XX and in Mark 21, the one XX, seven XX, uh, six XXs, as well as the data that's in the three XXs in the bibliographic record, as well as information in the authority records, the information, the, the fields that have been initially targeted, um, generally, yes, um, you can um, use a, a well-structured rules uh, filed, uh, rules um, process to, to generate URIs. Um, whether the infrastructure there is another question, but the, the, the rules um, are such that, that it, is, it is possible. Um, is it generally 
possible to do it in a systematic way, accounting for variations in marked data and input standards? Um, again, uh, generally, yes. Um, the marked data has changed a lot through the years, but the, the changes um, are relatively um, uh, systematic and easy to understand if you have a background in uh, general library description. Um, there are places, obviously, where you have user input error, um, as well as um, disagreements in how data should be, how should have been structured over time. Um, those are somewhat more difficult to accommodate. Um, but I think that in uh, in a linked data context, sometimes um, the ability to not generate um, URIs to entries that you know should be established um, is a way to to do data cleanup. And in fact, has been um, something that that we found during the course of of the pilot testing across a number of library catalogs. Um, so I do think that generally, yes. Um, you can, in a systematic way, account for a, a good deal of variation in the MARC format, um, as well as input standards. Um, universally, no. Um, is the process repeatable? Could it work beyond MARC 21? That is definitely yes. Uh, the rules that the PCC has been laying out, um, uh, they're tied to specific fields, um, but they also represent concepts. Those fields themselves represent concepts. And so um, you can take those concepts and apply them to other MARC frameworks. And, and I have actually spent some time um, taking the, the rules file generated for this pilot and applying it to um, Unimark, which I'm not an expert in. Um, so obviously some of the, uh, the initial mappings that I've been working on probably aren't true. Um, but I think that um, in, in experimenting with that work, um, if, of remapping the conceptual data um, that the PCC has been working on into um, Unimark, um, I think that, that I could say that, yes, the process should be repeatable outside of a Mark 21 world. Uh, does the library have the infrastructure to support these goals? Um, probably not right now. Um, one of the things that um, we have definitely found over the course of uh, the last year is that um, uh, the tools that we have, uh, the infrastructure that we have is improving quickly, um, but probably isn't anywhere in uh, ready um, to do the kind of large scale uh, reconciliation work that's probably necessary. Um, I also think one of the things that we found is gaps in the infrastructure, places where um, we have organizations that, that want to lead, um, but, but for whatever ver reason, most often resources um, is are taking a very slow approach to this, and I think OCLC is probably one of those folks where, um, you know, they're in a very weird position of, of having a community that they work with that, that they're ultimately responsible to, um, but at the same time wanting to provide these kind of infrastructure hubs for the library community in general, um, and those um, those don't always, uh, uh, the, that, that has essentially made it where a number of the services they provide um, uh, probably aren't, aren't necessarily um, to a point where they meet specific needs for some of the work that we need to do. And I guess the last question is, can this process be local? Um, is it possible for users to add their own endpoints? Um, again, um, in the pilot test, this was this was something that came up, and, and generally, yes, as long as um, local process can uh, support some very well-known standards. And in, in my case, working through um, the, the pilot, those standards ended up being um, uh, some kind of general RESTful interface, preferably Sparkle, but didn't have to be. Um, and an, out, an output a, an, an output that's in JSON um, that can be easily parsed by um, an application and an ability to be able to define uh, where the, the expected data is going to live within that JSON object. And I'll explain this a little bit further. All right, so the pilot testing process. So there were actually multiple pilots that were done as part of the PCC. Um, one of them focused primarily on authority data. Um, Mark Edit um, was used as part of this pilot, um, and it was um, used to test not only authority data, but also bibliographic data. Uh, there was a couple reasons for doing it. 
Um, one is that um, I had been working um, with the Library of Congress for about a year prior to the PCC group um, being formed. Um, and in fact, I had been working with uh, Jackie Shea um, uh, for probably about um, eight months before the, the PCC group got formed to start talking about some of this. Um, and I think that that's true of, of a number of the folks that are in uh, working on these groups, that they work at institutions um, that have been um, moving ahead um, with uh, how to represent linked data concepts within library metadata um, for um, a, 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 a while, um, at least uh, a while in terms of um, uh, how short a period of time we've been doing this. Um, and. Uh, so we all come with at this with a, a, a set of, um, of um, uh, come at this having having done some of this work locally within our institutions. Um, although obviously that work tends to be tied to our local institutions. So the tools was um, works with a lot of different metadata types. Um, so that's uh, that was a, a plus for the pilot. Um, it's it's got a fairly large user community. Um, uh, international user community. So the folks who were part of the pilot were familiar with um, the, or part of the, the PCC group are familiar with the application. Um, and most of the vendors that we, we discuss the issues um, that we're dealing with are also familiar with it. So or understand how, how that works. Um, and also um, about a year prior to this group being formed, I, I um, went ahead and included a research toolkit into MarkEdit uh, specifically um, to start exploring some of these issues. Um, the toolkit's called MarkNext. And so um, because the, a good deal of the heavy lifting was already done, um, I think that it made a, that was part of the reason why um, and, and made sense for MarkEdit to be one of the, the pilot applications to, to test um, the the work and the concepts that the PCC was, uh, the PCC Link Data Group was was working through. So this is what Mark Next looks like. This is the the research toolkit. So you can see there's a bib frame test bed, a JSON viewer, um, linked identifiers, which is the tool that actually does the work that um, creates URIs and, and a record set, and then a Sparkle browser. Uh, this is an updated version of the linked data tool. Um, you can see it takes a source file and a save file. Um, it automatically detects um, uh, data in main entry and subject IDs based on information within a, a localized rule file, processes 3xx fields and authority as well as bibliographic data. Um, and new to the tool is the ability to limit resolution of URIs to specific um, indexes. So if, for example, you are a mesh user and you have a set of records that include multiple vocabularies, rather than having MarkEdit automatically detect all of those vocabularies and resolve all of the URIs, which probably something that, that you may want to do in the future, um, if you were just particularly interested in the mesh headings, um, you could limit the reconciliation to just those headings. And I'll, I'll show an example of that here in a second. Um, this is the graphical interface um, to um, the linked data tool set. Um, the tool set also is available through um, the uh, command line interface, which is available in all versions of uh, MarkEdit, um, so uh, Mac, Linux, and um, Windows. Um, and also, there's um, an API that you can work with to um, interact with the data. You'll also see on the right, there are two other elements. One is working with OCLC's VOF, and the other one's to embed work IDs into the OCLC, uh, into a, a MARC record. Um, these are um, have been um, uh, somewhat um, experimental. The VOF tool works very well, although from my personal um, my personal preferences um, uh, or, or bent is that VOF probably never should show up in a MARC record, um, uh, mostly because I'm, uh, in, I, I like to think of um, the subfield zero, which we use to uh, create URIs for um, vocabulary terms as being the value that's closest to the authorized source, um, in which case if I'm using LCSH, I'd want to link to the Library of Congress, even though I could create a VOF identifier for it. But in the 
the case of VOF, you have something that's more of a an aggregate. It's it's not really a representation of that that value. It's more of a, an aggregate of of multiple um, vocabularies together. Um, so it's a very different thing. Um, although I do know some people who like to use VOF as as their identifier of choice. Um, so the tool makes that available, but it's it's not. Um, for the demonstrations here, it's not the the one I would I would use to 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 link to. Um, so initial challenges, um, probably the hardest part of doing this work up front was the specifications kept changing. Um, initially, when I created Mark Edit's uh, link data tools and and worked with Jackie Shea early on, um, because she was really interested in doing some of this work at George Washington. Um, the target of the work was really LCSH, um, and it was primarily looking at a handful of, of very specific fields. But once the, the the group of experts got together and started talking about this, the the universe of fields that were evaluated and the number of subfields needing to be taken into account, as well as indicators, as well as um, uh, vocabularies, uh, suddenly expanded. And it expanded very quickly. Um, and that made it really difficult to do the pilot testing because initially Mark Edits um, uh, data was hard-coded. So all the rules files that I was using um, to process the data were hard-coded. And so each time a new uh, vocabulary was added or each time the rules were expanded or modified, it meant having to go in and change code. And that is um, uh, was difficult um, because the rules were changing um, sometimes daily uh, early on. So uh, the way to overcome that um, was to uh, think about um, how you could separate uh, the rules and the knowledge base for handling uh, the, the linked data processing from the actual application that, that's doing the, the lookups, the reconciliation work. Um, and this was actually um, something that was done partly to work with MarkEdit, but partly um, to provide a rules file that could be used in other applications um, or it could be recoded into other languages. And, and just for, for fun, I've taken uh, the rules file that MarkEdit uses um, and recoded it into um, a Ruby gem um, that I'm experimenting with um, to allow the, the same kind of reconciliation work to, to happen through um, that kind of a process. Uh, so the, the approach that I took um, in doing this was to um, break the rules files into characteristics. So there's a, a, a part of the rules file that handles um, fielded data. Um, so that's going to be rather either bibliographic or authority um, data, as well as collections. So uh, collection data. And I'm going to just pull this up really quickly, uh, something I didn't have time to do when we were at um, the uh, session. Um, so Mark Edit's uh, rules file lives um, here. There's an edit rules file, um, and I can edit the rules file, and this will open the data up into whatever your um, uh, XML editor happens to be, and in my case, it's Oxygen. So um, it will open up the rules file. Uh, the rules file doesn't have a schema file attached to it, so it's not self-descriptive, which I'm, I will probably change at some point. Uh, so I've tried to include um, in the rules file, um, you'll see, make this bigger. Um, in the rules file, I've tried to include information about when it's been changed last, as well as how the rules file um, gets applied. So we have field blocks at a top level, which are either authority, bibliographic, or bibliographic authority. There are tags, which represent the field to be processed, subfield codes, indicators one and two, um, an index, which tells the application um, where the index field is. So for example, in Mark 21, that would be in most cases a subfield two. Um, there's options about whether or not it's sticky. And this is a, a weird term because um, in the authority records, um, there are a number of fields where multiple concepts show up within a field, um, all within subfield A's. And within a linked data context, it's especially in MARC, um, it would be unfortunate to um, create um, meaning 
with proximity. So in order to know, uh, for example, in, in a field like that, where say you had two subfield, three subfield A's and all of them represent different concepts, um, it would be unfortunate if that field looked like subfield A, subfield zero, subfield A, subfield zero, subfield A, subfield zero, um, because you have to understand that those paired fields mean something. And that's actually you know, knowledge you have to code into, into a process. It makes more sense to break these fields up, especially if they can be repeatable so that each concept stands within its own field. So you have a field with a subfield A and a, a subfield zero. So that's easy to do in, a, in, an autom in an atomized sense, which is what this atomized value stands for. Um, where you run into problems are values that um, say, uh, and this happens a lot in, in music cataloging, um, the authority files, where you have um, three subfield A's that are all different concepts, but then there's, say, like an N and a P or something like that that are, um, that are values that are a part of all of those conceptual terms. They, they relate to each of those three conceptual terms. So those are what I call sticky values. So these are subfields that should always be present when a uh, set of concepts are broken apart. We have special instructions. Um, so um, in order to process names and subjects or a mixture of names and subjects, um, there's a set of special algorithms that are used to enable the application to understand what it's looking for. Um, and to help it along, there's a special instruction field that tells um, Mark at its application, um, is it a name, is it a subject, or can I expect a mixture of the two? Um, and that, that goes a long ways towards helping the application take into account the various types of variation that you see in the data between these different types. Um, the URI, this is the subfield code where the URI will eventually show up. Again, in Mark 21, we're primarily looking at subfield zero as well as a couple of other fields. Uh, in Unimark, that field may be different. And so the, the ability to be able to tag it. And then the last one is vocabulary, and this is an optional field. So if there's no index, Supplied. So, for example, no subfield two in a in a field that designates which um, index a a um, control vocabulary is pulling from. You can set the vocabulary um, in the rules block, and the application will use that um, when when validating your data. And that value is, is can be an array, so you can have multiple uh, vocabularies. So um, here's an example of what these look like. Um, here is um, a 600 field, uh, bibliographic processing. Um, you can see special instructions are mixed because it can have both names and, and topical terms. The vocabularies, if it's a zero, is the name authority in LCSH. One is children subject headings, two is mesh. And seven um, are has no vocabulary, but it um, queries the index that's found in the subfield two, and then looks up the collections to see if it's been profiled within the application. So that's what you see here. This is this is a block. It's a 650 block. The other rules file, the other part of the rules file that needs to exist is a collections-based um, rules file, and this is um, in order for the application to know which collection it's looking up. Um, the market, it's linked data platform. There's a, a set of tools that are that are part of the application that are actually. Um, available on GitHub if you want to see how MarkEdit does it, um, in, and this is all written in C Sharp, um, that allows the application to um, read collections. And this allows users to create their own collection file. So this is how we deal with that, that notion of, of a good deal of our data will be local. Um, in this case, we have a, a Sparkle URL um, that's been crafted to the Japanese Diet Library um, that outputs a, um, a, a JSON value. And so you can see here in the path of the collection, um, we provide a, a, a value here that, that maps out in the JSON object structure where the URI would be present if it's resolved. Um, 
you can also use just a plain REST query so long as that REST query um, uh, is uh, basically a set of ter search terms as well as uh, a few other labels that the, the application supports. The primary um, requirement is the output has to be JSON so that you can create this path structure. Um, there's also a, uh, other um, resolution um, in the collections profile, and that's for items that have static um, identifiers, in which case you're not necessarily having to look up a value, but that identifier um, is part of the URI path, you can use a pattern to replace it. And so um, here we have an example in the um, uh, rules file that shows how collections are defined. Um, collections are defined with a top level of collection, um, the name, which is the name of the service, um, which is the a human readable name, which does get used uh, in the application elsewhere. The label, which is the label that's um, going to be used to identify the collection in the subfield too. So in this case, we have um, an example of fast, which is how OCLC identifies the, the fast. Um, tag, so the label would be label is fast. Uh, the URI, so this is the URI query endpoint. Search terms is used to denote the placeholder um, for the application. Um, and then the last one, uh, so here we have path, so this is the URI um, to, or the, the path statement um, in the JSON object. Uh, and I don't see it, so let me, there's an example of one here. Um, the last element that isn't in that note, and I need to add it, is pattern. And so pattern um, is used when, and this is used for, in this case, the German National Library, but also you'll see pattern used um, in uh, VOF, the VOF definition, let's see where it's at. Here we go, OCLC VOF, we have a URL. Um, but there is uh, also a pattern that uh, uh, I apparently, oh, here we go for fast headings. So there's both a URL and a pattern. So if um, in OCLC, uh, they're including a lot of subfield zeros where the uh, pattern um, just has the identifier. Uh, in this case, if the subfield zero isn't there, it will do the lookup at the URL. If this subfield zero is there and it's not a HTTP, it's not a URI identifier, it will use this pattern to construct um, a link to the, uh, the identifier. Um, so we have different ways to define collections and a number of collections that have been defined within the application. All right. This process has allowed us to create a pilot that can be flexible and move as the PCC is redefining or um, uh, working with uh, different vocabularies um, and talking to vocabulary owners. Um, and this is actually happening through the, the working group members themselves who are in addition to the pilot process that we're doing, using their own tools and services that maybe they've created locally um, to start implementing some of these, these concepts and working with vocabularies. And so as we work with the vocabularies, um, it's giving me an opportunity to, to talk to the folks who maintain these services as well as um, profile them for use not only within MarkEdit, but again, theoretically, uh, provide a um, rules file um, as part of this pilot process that then could be potentially used within other contexts. Um, so making the process repeatable, so again, that's part of the reason for the rules file. This rules file allows users to recode into any MARC format because each of the rules files um, elements, uh, the rules file encompasses all of the, the potential data elements that can be in, in a MARC record. Um, you do have the option to be able to accommodate a wide range of formats and, and at least through my initial testing with MARC 21 and Unimark, there didn't appear to be cases where um, 
um, the rules file doesn't support um, the potential um, use cases in terms of um, mapping Mark 21 concepts to um, how those would be represented in Unimark. Um, I think the other thing is the um, uh, rules file allows for the combination creations of URIs with other URI types. Um, so while the focus initially was on the subfield zero, there are a number of other subfields that are being discussed for different types of URIs um, and potentially the application could support that, that work. Um, so here's an example of before and after. Um, on the one side, we have a set of records that have 100 fields, 3XX fields, 600 fields from multiple vocabularies. If we run it through uh, MarkEdit's um, rules file, we see that the data, um, uh, when appropriate and when, when able, um, can generate um, URIs to the various elements. So in this case, we see elements generated from FAST. We see an, uh, elements generated from um, those uh, LC's genre terms. Um, we see ones generated from um, the uh, Japanese diet library, I believe, in this set. Uh, no, not in this set. Um, we see FAST headings, we see um, uh, RDA headings from um, the uh, LC uh, vocabulary sets, we see authorities um, for um, the 100, we see 600s. Um, so we see a lot of data that's been um, generated um, as part of this process, and you'll see it also um, accommodates 880 fields, so linked data, linked linking fields that are in the record. Uh, so I'm going to show you um, just a quick demo um, of how this works within the application um, because uh, some folks have been interested. So uh, the way that this works within MarkEdit, um, you can run the linked data tool set in two different places. Um, one, you can run it from directly within MarkEdit, the Mark Editor. Um, if you happen to have a file open, um, so let's say we, we open up a file here. Um, and I have um, some original data sets. Let me open up, uh, let's say, this one here. Um, and I don't think this one actually needs to be run. We'll just open this data set. So if we open this data set, we see um, here, um, this was a data set I'd gotten from um, the uh, National Library of Germany, and you can see they've already done um, their URI work, so I don't have to rerun it. Um, but if I did, I could actually run that tool set here by going to Tools, uh, Link Data Tools, um, Build Links. Um, and within MarkEdit, you can encode um, that link data process into what's called a task, um, which is an automated way of managing um, specific operations. You'll see here um, in the particular actions, you'll see there's a linked data task that you can add to the app, to, to your central macro that you run. Um, so the other place you can run it is from within Mark Next, Link Data Tools. This opens a standalone application where you can select um, which elements you actually want to process. Um, lately, I've been having conversations with folks who are interested in targeting very specific um, vocabularies. So I'm going to go ahead and grab um, this one. This is uh, National Library of Medicine. Uh, this is just their bibliographic data. And so if I wanted to just process BESH headings and no other elements, um, I could I'll go ahead and toss that into just MESH headings. I'll overwrite the file that's there. I can select the either just subjects or I can auto detect any other fields just in case maybe a mesh heading shows up elsewhere. Um, and then I can select from this list the um, resource that I want to run. If I want to limit to multiple headings, I would put a semicolon and add the additional vocabularies I want to run. But in this case, I'm going to do just mesh. Um, I tell it to go ahead and go process that data. And the tool will now um, start uh, communicating with uh, the uh, mesh sparkle endpoint based on the data that's been configured within the rules file um, and the data that it finds uh, within the mark record. And so if we uh, wait here a couple of minutes, it looked like there was uh, 33k of records. So um, there's probably, there we go, 17 records in the file. Um, if we go back and we look at that record set now, Uh, we can look at that just METS file. Well, actually, we'll open uh, this file first. This is the file we processed originally. And then uh, let me open the just METS file as well. The 
Just messed file here. I just mess and let that file open here. We can see um, the the data that's been embedded. So in this case, this is the file that we generated. Um, this was the file that it started with. You'll see here in the uh, 500 fields, uh, 650 fields, we have um, data that uh, needs to be resolved. We look over here into the other one, we see that that data has been resolved into the mesh headings. But you'll see that in the 100 field, for example, where there is actually a um, LCSH, um, a, a name authority for this, this person, um, as well as all the 300 data, none of that data was, was processed because we asked it not to. Um, we were just processing data um, that shows up in fields that are tagged um, as using the mesh vocabulary. Um, and so this allows us to do um, multiple passes of metadata processing. So you could start with, instead of doing everything all at once, which may take a significant amount of time, um, you could process individual um, control vocabularies um, and build up the linked data concepts within your records over multiple runs of data, or you could do it all at once um, and just take uh, uh, however much time it takes to, to process all of those different collection sets. All right, so that's just a very quick demo. All right, so the biggest problems for libraries, at least in the pilot process, has been um, infrastructure problems. Um, so uh, the, when working through this process, there were a couple of technical challenges that fell into one of four categories, and I can't believe I don't have it written down. I actually wrote it down on a piece of paper, so hopefully it'll come to me as I'm talking. But there are three that I wrote down here um, that uh, are showing up, and so one is service capacity, one is um, uh, this problem of uh, does an item exist, asking that question specifically, um, and then the problem of uh, non-standard API is quirky data models or encodings um, and we'll see if I can remember the, the fourth one or maybe it's in the slide somewhere I'm, I can't remember um, so the first problem that, that I run that we run into um, really has to do with the present infrastructure not being geared toward um, these type of um, large-scale lookups uh, most um, infrastructure seems to be geared more towards auto lookups. Um, we have a good example of it in the Getty um, where it works really well if what you're looking for is looking for the data suggest terms. Um, the problem is um, when you want to throw lots of data at it, um, that's these systems tend to not be able to handle lots of data being dumped on it. Um, the other problem is that a lot of times I want to know, does an, a specific item exist? I don't want auto suggestions. I need to be able to give it a term and get a yes or no answer. And in a lot of these auto suggested services, it's very difficult to get a no answer. They're always going to give you back something because you might have meant something else that, that, uh, that's a different term misspelled. Um, that's a problem. Now, there are ways to get around it. Um, in the Getty, you can get yes, no queries by querying the Lucene indexes um, rather than the, the straight up um, uh, traditional, more traditional Sparkle style searches. Um, but that, that requires um, um, a bit of work and it also means that the data encoding sometimes gets a little, little bit odd. Service capacity. Um, so the present infrastructure, um, and this is true really across the board, really isn't well suited for bulk real-time data lookups. Um, the Library of Congress does a has done a spectacular job, um, in my opinion, of trying to accommodate this kind of work. Um, they work with the community. Um, they have worked with me um, far more than, than I deserve um, because I pass way too much data to them on a, on a regular basis. Um, and I have an application um, that makes it really, really easy for people to just dump large amounts of data on them. Um, and over the last two years, they've, rather than blocking, um, the application or its users um, have worked uh, um, at times closely with me to understand 
um, what are the best ways of interacting uh, within their system and it's given me an opportunity to talk to them about best ways to provide feedback um, to an application that is working to go through this style of real-time data processing. Um, and that's led to some really interesting um, enhancement work within MarkEdit. Um, so for example, um, one of the uh, mitigation techniques that I use within the application is, is real-time active caching because within the Library of Congress's context and, and any context of, of doing controlled um, vocabulary lookups, very often you're doing a lot of duplicative lookup um, by caching the data as, uh, uh, on a service request, um, I can eliminate um, multiple requests to the service and handle those locally and that, that uh, helps to alleviate a lot um, the uh, the overhead pro the the processing that happens um, on these services. Um, there are other options. Uh, Library of Congress, for example, doesn't provide a, a Sparkle query per se, but they do provide um, uh, an API that's really optimized for this kind of um, uh, high yield lookup. Um, and this data all lives within a header. Um, requests. So um, I can make really um, low impact queries um, that uh, take very little data uh, and get back at the information needed to be able to do these kind of um, uh, reconciliation lookups. Uh, the last one is um, has been working with them to utilize status codes to um, denote system health. Uh, so being able to um, at a more granular level be able to give feedback to applications um, to let the application know that the, the server is busy and rather than just terminating connections um, and essentially blocking all lookups past, past that point, um, giving the application the information it needs to essentially pause itself and let the, uh, the, the um, source system, um, the, the, the backend system catch up. Um, and then be able to take requests again. Um, so that's been um, really interesting work, um, but it's definitely led to um, an understanding that um, I don't honestly think that, that uh, the, the, the infrastructure, at least as we have it now, uh, would be anywhere suited for the kind of bulk lookups that, that might have to happen um, over a, um, uh, uh, at least in a, over a short period of time um, were lots of libraries to implement this kind of linked data work. Um, because unfortunately, um, there are some places like OCLC that could solve a number of their problems, uh, that they could do a lot of this linked data work, and it would work great within WorldCat. Um, but within your local library um, catalog, unless your local system does that work for you, and again, would be doing it unless you have a cloud-based ILS um, over um, local instances, we're still going to be in this place, at least probably for a little while, at least within the current infrastructure we have, where if linked data work happens, it's going to happen um, uh, in a very distributed manner, um, where lots and lots and lots of people are probably going to be querying um, single points of failure, and that, that the infrastructure we have just doesn't, just doesn't, um, doesn't seem uh, to set to accommodate that kind of work. Um, Non-standard APIs. Um, Sparkle isn't well represented um, within the collection space that we use. I mentioned the Library of Congress has a non-Sparkle query, although to be honest, I prefer what they have because it's very well, it's, um, it uh, is uh, well optimized for the kind of work that uh, is being done. But again, it's, an, it's a non-standard API. Uh, the Getty vocabularies require knowledge, extra knowledge of working with Lucene. Uh, the German National Library has this really interesting, um, the German National Authority file has this interesting representation with linked data, but it requires using Elastic encodings in order to do the query. So you have lots of APIs being proposed, um, lots of different models being represented in order to provide um, structured data back to the community in, in a um, um, queryable form, um, but a lot of the APIs are, are uh, moving quickly and, and still in a variety of, um, of standards. Uh, ideally, and, and folks had asked me this while, while we were presenting, um, in order for this to, to really work well, it would be nice if we could, you know, 
um, agree upon a, an, an encoding standard even um, so that when we make queries, everybody knows um, how these queries should look going into um, a system rather than having to have each collection be so specific. Um, one of the challenges of profiling each collection is to try and determine uh, which, um, which characters have to be passed um, utilizing non-standard uh, rules for uh, data escaping in a URL. So within some of these services, some data has to be passed um, as um, literals. You can't escape the data um, and have the resolution work. Uh, sometimes you have to use um, escapings for very particular indexers. So for example, like Elasticsearch. And that does make um, working with these collections very challenging for folks who need to um, work with a lot of collections because you have to profile and understand um, how each of these collections modeled um, their data, have encoded their data, um, and expect users to interact with their data. And that, that makes the, the process much more difficult. Um, Long-term technical challenges. Um, I think that the the current present infrastructure definitely recommends, re definitely um, demonstrates a very long-term challenge. Um, I think that there's um, seems to be um, underwhelming support for the kind of creation of large-scale reconciliation services um, that need to be done, and I think part of that comes from the cost. Uh, it's a lot easier to dump a large file and make that available um, than to provide a real-time interactive system that um, accommodates both um, the real world use case of this more kind of auto suggest service, which would be used maybe for one off cataloging, um, but also a use case of more of a reconciliation service where you have batch processing happening um, when the data needs to be done in real time. A data dump makes a lot of sense when your data doesn't have to be fresh and can, have, and can be stale um, for say a quarter or even a year. Um, it's the, the need to be able to have real time um, data that uh, is, represents the most current, um, most current uh, concepts that, that is more difficult to do and, and currently doesn't really exist well. And I, and I do think that comes down to the cost. Um, these services are really expensive to maintain, partly because they need to be able to withstand a large scale of a large number of requests um, over a very short period of time. But that use case, which is the use case that, that I personally tend to be most interested in represents such a small, um, uh, a small representation of what they probably will be doing long term. And so I, I get, you know, how do you scale these services? Do you, do you develop a service that that is geared towards more of the auto suggestion style service, which probably represents um, probably 80 percent to 90 percent of your traffic? Or do you provide an infrastructure that um, is scaled for these uh, large um, reconciliation projects, which requires a very different infrastructure? Um, is there a way to do both? Um, I think that's been one of the, the things that, that libraries still need to work through. And I think that the question is, who's going to pay for that? I, I, um, I, I feel um, I feel really bad for, for groups like OCLC who have a, um, um, a very well-defined user community. It's the membership. Um, but you also have this larger mission of supporting uh, the library community um, and this notion of developing a linked data service that is an infrastructure component um, to the larger library community that will support at scale these kind of reconciliation services that can be an aggregator for the kind of work that, that, that folks talk about when they start thinking about um, linked data services um, is expensive. Um, really expensive, and it's it's an, it's um, you know an expense that you know I, I look at and wonder who you know how they pay for that um, in in a since this also isn't a service that's going to generate any kind of revenue. It it's a 
It's an infrastructure component, so it just costs money. Um, I think those are challenges um, that that will have to be solved long term uh, in order for the community to be able to develop um, develop the kind of I think linked data services that we want. Um, but I do think it's it's a long term challenge that that I don't. I don't actually see anybody uh, solving right now. Um, so finally, um, folks who are interested um, in playing around with Mark Edit, and there are, I believe, um, some um, a YouTube some YouTube videos talking about how the, the linked data stuff works. If you watch this video and you'd like to see a little bit more of how that works, um, or just follow the development and see how it changes, um, you can download the application. Uh, it runs on all platforms, Windows, Linux, uh, Mac, um, from the URL here. Um, if you're interested in how MarkEdit approaches um, the linked data processing, um, you can look at its linked data platform code, which lives in uh, this particular GitHub um, repository. Um, OK, and if you have questions, um, my um, URI email address, I believe, is on the first slide of this particular process. So uh, that's the end of these slides. Um, as I mentioned before, um, this is just my part of the session that was done um, while we were at Dublin Core, and I'm recording it partly because I wish I we would have recorded it while we were there, um, partly because I've been um, receiving some questions um, off and on over the last um, a couple of weeks, and it just seemed easier to um, provide uh, a recorded output of this session um, since I, I don't have a, a notes page uh, for this work. Um, so hopefully this has been useful. If it has been um, great. If you have questions, further questions, feel free to contact me and let me know. Um, if you are interested in um, piloting some work or have a collection of um, linked data Link data vocabularies that you'd like Mark Edit to pro, uh, pi, uh, profile into its collection resource. Um, uh, feel free to let me know as well. Um, so um, that's it.